Bibles, you can turn to 1 John chapter 4. So, we are in 1 John because John is the apostle of love. Talk more about love than anybody else, and today's a day of love. So, happy Valentine's Day. But uh, I'm not talking about my love for you, or your love for your spouse, or your girlfriend, or boyfriend, or, or son, or daughter, or anything like that. We're talking about God's love for us. So, let's read a little bit here. 1 John chapter 4. Starting verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. <clears throat> and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. So, if we're going to describe reality, our reality, the biblical worldview, which we say is true, which I know to be true, and hopefully you believe is true, it's really a story between a father and a son. You see, before... Well, in the beginning, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. That's what it says, right? In the beginning, there was God. Well, really, in, in actuality, before the beginning, there was God. God always was. And He is. And He always will be. God. Now, when He created the world, He didn't create the world because He was bored. He did not create the world because He was lonely. Because we know that God has eternally existed as the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, we don't understand the Trinity fully because nothing in this world compares to it. All we know is that there is one God, eternally, three persons. Father, Son, and Spirit. They've always existed together. There's only one God in a Trinity. What characterized that relationship between Father, Son, and Spirit? It was love. 1 John 4, 8, up here, says, The one who loves does not know God. For God is love. We already read in verse 16, God is love. That relationship was characterized by love. Jesus himself in John 17, 24, when he prayed to the Father, he said, you loved me before the foundation of the world. Always there was love. Perfect harmony, perfect unity, perfect love. When the Father chose to create the world, okay, he chose that for his Son. The universe was God's gift to the Son, the Father's gift to the Son. In Colossians 1.16, it says that all things came into being not only through the Son, but for the Son. We exist for Him. That's an amazing thought. Hebrews 2.10, speaking of the Son, says that all things are for Him. Not only through Him, but for Him. So it was like this, the Father loved the Son so much for eternity. He enjoyed the Son so much. Now, he created the entire universe as a gift for his son. And then, he didn't stop there. He created us, personal beings, just like him, in his image, so that we, too, could love the son and know the son and delight in the son. It was all about the son. The father gave the son us. It's an amazing thought. We were created to love God and enjoy him forever. That's what the old creeds always said. We were created to love God and enjoy him forever. But now, of course, we know that for love to be free, there's got to be a choice, right? Love that I couldn't kidnap Katie and force her to marry me. I mean, I guess I could in some countries. It doesn't mean she loved me. That's not love. Love's got to be free, freely chosen, freely given. So he gets in the garden and gives us a choice. You can love me and enjoy me. You know, just as a side note, if we believe that the, uh, God came to the Garden of Eden and walked around with Adam and Eve, which we believe, right, in the cool of the day, walk through the garden. Well, the sun has always been the image of the invisible God. So if they saw anyone in that garden, you know who they saw, you know who they were walking with, you know who they were enjoying, the sun. Love freely given. And what did we do? We denied it. We broke the one rule. Chose to love ourselves. When Eve saw the fruit in the garden, what was it? It was all about her. 
She's like, you know, it is desirable to make me wise. It looks good to my eyes. It looks like it would taste good to me. So forget the sun, forget God. I want to eat this. And Adam, you eat some too. And they ate and boom, sin came, death came, the curse came. The world fell under this curse. Death reigned. Terrible things happened. Every bad thing that goes in our world today is all a result of this fallen world because we fell into sin. It was a tragedy. It was the tragedy. But think about this. Though we turned from God, there was one person who didn't. One person who didn't sin. One person who never turned their back on the Father. And that was the Son. The Son remained faithful. The Son continued to love His Father and never turned from that love. It's an amazing picture. Isaiah 42.1, this is what, the God, what God says. The Father, behold my servants whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. Throughout the Old Testament, God the Father is still delighting in the Son, loving the Son. So he's my chosen one. He's the one my soul rejoices in. Can you imagine God the Father as a doting dad? Can you imagine that? You know, the one, his soul leaps when he thinks of his son. The Father who wants to still give everything to his son. But he does. Think about this. In Isaiah 42, 8, this is what God says. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another. This is what Jesus says in John 17, 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. The Father shares his unshareable glory with the Son. That's love. And we know that the Son became flesh and was born. His name is Jesus. You know, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, what did the Father say? It says in Matthew 3.17, Behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It's an amazing picture. When Jesus was on the mountain of, and he was being transfigured and his, some of his disciples saw him and they didn't know what to do and Peter sees Jesus in his glory and he's next to Moses and Elijah and he says, oh, it's great that we're here, Lord. We can make you a tent and then you guys can hang out in the tent. And Jesus looks at him and then all of a sudden the Father breaks out of heaven again and says this, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is my son, my loved son, the son that I am pleased with. It's an amazing thing. The Father speaks from heaven three times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Once to Jesus and twice about Jesus. And we just read both times he spoke about Jesus. And all he had to say was, I love him and I am pleased with him. So Jesus was loved. John the Baptist took those words to heart. And he is quoted in John 3.35 and says, simply says this, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Jesus knew he was loved by God. In John 5.20, this is what Jesus says, The Father loves the Son and shows him everything he's doing. He's in God. The Father holds nothing back. He invites Jesus and shows me all the things he's doing. Jesus says, I am loved by the Father. He says in Mark 12.6, he tells a parable about the vine growers. And it says this guy owned a vineyard, and he rented the vineyard out to these people, and they were not sending him the money, so he sent servant after servant, and they were killing the servants. And finally, he says, I know who I'll send. I'll send my beloved son, his loved son. Whenever Jesus talks about being a son of God, he always throws love in there because that's what defines him. It's an amazing thing. John 10, 17, for this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. So people could reject Jesus. People could hate Jesus. People reviled him and they mocked him, eventually murdered him. But he didn't define himself by anything. In fact, when people were worshiping him during this one moment, John writes that he didn't even care that they were worshiping him because he knows what's in man. What defined Christ was not what people thought. And it wasn't what Mary thought. His mother who treasured all these things in his heart. And he loved his mom on the cross. He made sure that she was protected. And he tells the Apostle John, hey, remember my mother. And he tells Mary, hey, this is your son now. Loved his mom. But that didn't define him. What defined him was the love of his father. The love of God. Jesus was loved. So do you get that this morning? Because that's my first point. Jesus was loved Greatly by the Father. And if you can't get that, then the rest of the sermon is not going to make much sense and you won't care about it. You have to understand that Jesus was loved. He knew he was loved. He was the only one who stayed faithful, didn't turn back. The world was a gift to him. I mean, this is the most loved son in the history of the universe. For eternity, Jesus, the Father, loves him. Okay. 
Now, what if I told you that you are loved just as much as Jesus is? That Jesus Christ is not loved any more than you, and you are not loved any less than Jesus. Does that sound blasphemous? Look, you are loved like Jesus. I'm going to prove it to you. Um, I think we all understand that God loves the world, right? John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That is, God loves us. In Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated his love to us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And 1 John 4, 9 says, By this the love of God was manifested to us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. So we understand that God loves the world. But what I think we fail to understand is how great that love really is. That it's as great as the love he has for the Son. If you have your Bibles, we're going to flip over, and I think you should do this because you don't want to take my word for it, it's John 17. There's seven words in this verse I'm about to read to you that change my life and can change yours. John chapter 17, we're going to read in verse 24. Sorry, 22 says, this is Jesus' high priestly prayer, okay? He just ate the last supper with his apostles. He's given them his final words before his arrest and death. And John 17, Jesus prays to the Father, his big, last, high priestly prayer. Verse 22, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they, may, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me, ready, and love them, even as you have loved me. Now, he's not talking about the twelve apostles, because go up to verse 20. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, those around him, but for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. You see that? He's talking about every believer, the ones who will believe based on the words of the apostles. So he's talking about you and me right here. And he says that the Father has loved us even as he loved the Son. Even as, equal to, he loves you just as much as he loved Jesus. He goes on in verse 25. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, Yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them, and will make it known, so that the love which you have loved me, with which you have loved me, may be in them, and I in them. Do you guys see that? This is what Jesus said in, verse, in chapter 15, verse 9, if you want to look that up. It says, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. So not only are you loved by the Father as much as Jesus is loved, but Jesus loves you as much as the Father loves him. And when I say you, I mean you personally, individually, particularly. This is always my problem. I understood that God loved us, but I struggled to personalize that love and believe he loved me. I believed he loved the world enough to give up his son because he's trading his son's life for for billions and billions of lives. And I would hear pastors get up there and say, if you were the last one alive, Jesus would still die for you. And I thought to myself, I don't know if that's true. It can't be proven. Then I realized this. How did the Apostle John describe himself? Whenever he referenced himself in the whole Gospel of John, it was always the disciple whom Jesus loved. He didn't say that Jesus didn't love the other disciples, but he was defined by the Savior's love for him. John says, I am the one that Jesus loved. He's also the one that says Jesus loved everybody. He wrote John 3.16. He recorded the words. He wrote John 15 and John 17. We read everything. But when it came to him, he was the one that was personally loved by Jesus. And Paul was the same way. In Galatians 2.20, it's a famous verse. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. You see that? So Paul, who preaches the gospel to everyone and says, everyone, God loves you and everyone needs to be saved. He says in 1 Timothy that God desires everyone to be saved. Yet right here in Galatians, he says, Jesus died for me. And Jesus loves me. So it can be personalized. You personally are loved like Jesus. 
If we go back to our, our text in 1 John chapter 4, it says that we have come to know and have believed the love that God has for us. We have not only come to know it, but to believe it. So how does this work? And how realistically can we be loved like Jesus? Because unlike Jesus, we have turned from God. We have sinned. And that's the beauty of the gospel, and it's why Christ himself came. You see, when we believe on the name of Jesus Christ, we are united with him. You have to understand this. All these verses I read you, Jesus says, I'm in them and they're in me. There has been a unification between us and Jesus when we get saved. Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches, right? I mean, there's this organic union between you and Jesus, and that's personal. You have to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Can't do it for anyone else. But when you do it, you are united with him. You are died, you dead, you, that doesn't make any sense. You were crucified with him. His death is your death. You were buried with him. And when he rose, you rose. His power to live is your power to live. It says this in Ephesians chapter 2. God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So this unification, you've already died, and you've been buried, and your sins have been paid for, and you rose again, and you have eternal life. John 3 doesn't say he'll give them eternal life one day. It says you have eternal life. They will not perish. They have eternal life. So let me just, you know, if it's eternal, can it end? He didn't say he'll give you life as long as you're good. He says I'll give them a life that will never end until they mess up. He gives you eternal life. Eternal life is eternal life. It's everlasting. So if you believed on Jesus, you have it. God sent Christ to rescue you, loved you first. And when you believe on the name of Jesus Christ, you are united with him and you receive the same love the Son receives. You're loved like Jesus. Now, like I said, the difference between knowing that and believing that. I heard of an author say that he was teaching a class one day and he was going over the love of God to his students and there was a girl sitting on the front row and he described how great God's love was for them and she looked up as she's taking notes and said yes and she was waiting for the next point point. and he thought he stopped and he thought to himself and said if I told her that her crush the guy she liked loved her with everything in him and the one thing that she wanted from him, the, the, his love, she, he had it for her. He had a big crush on her. He wanted to marry her. Would she just hear all that news and say, next point? No. She would rejoice and be happy. It would change her whole life. She would be like, yes, I'm not alone anymore. This guy loves me. Let's get married. Let's go. And yet when we hear about God's love for us, we go, okay, next point. So I know we know, but do we believe it? Do we believe that we are loved like Jesus is loved? I mean, can you wake up in the morning and say that I am loved as much as Jesus was loved, and Jesus is not loved by God more than me? Equal. Look at verse 17 here. We've come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. The one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us. So what it means is, by this, love is matured. Love is completed. Love reaches its goal in us. When we really not just know it, but believe it, this is what happens. So that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. He says, when love has reached its goal to our lives, and we finally grasped it and believed it, first off, there is no more fear of judgment. We can honestly sing in Christ alone, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. No fear in death. No fear of judgment. And then it says, why? Because as he is, so also are we in this world. And when he says he, he's referring to Jesus from verse 15. So why do we have no fear? Because as Jesus is, so are we. And as Jesus was, so were we. And as Jesus is today, so we will be. We are like Jesus. As he is, so are we. Can you wake up and honestly say, or before you go to bed, or when you're at your absolute worst and say, as Jesus was, so am I. Think about a couple aspects of the gospel. Here's the first one. You probably heard the term justification. OK? 
Okay? When you trusted Christ, the Bible says you were justified. Romans 5.1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It says 5.19, As through one man disobedience, as through one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. Justification means to be declared righteous. You are declared righteous. Perfect. Not a sinner, but a saint. You know, some churches like to take a really special Christian and call them a saint. You know, God takes every Christian and calls them a saint. You're a saint if you trusted Christ. It says in Romans 8.1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. It says in Ephesians 1.4, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before Him. So let me ask you this. What sin haunts you or holds you back? The answer, none. No sin holds you back. No sin separates you from God. No sin you've ever done and no sin you ever will do separates you from God. You are righteous. You're justified. You are as perfect and as righteous as Jesus Christ himself. The son who never turned away and fled. And when we left him and we sinned, we are just as favored and righteous and perfect and blameless as he himself. Because he's in us, we're united, and we've been declared righteous. That's an amazing thing. Justification by faith. By faith, not by works. You can't perform or earn it. It is by faith. All you have to do is believe on the name of Jesus Christ and you are united with him and declared to be righteous. It's an amazing thing. You are justified. Do you feel justified? Do you go to God as a righteous one? Do you go to God as if you are perfect? Say, God, I need this right now. In the name of Jesus, I need this and I know you love me. Or do we go to him? <sighs> You know, do you ever have an argument with somebody and you don't know where you stand with them? And then you see them again and, you know, you say hi, you're not going to be rude, but you're not as intimate or you're not as friendly. Or maybe if they saw you and you think they didn't see you, you may not yell out their name because you don't know where you stand. Do we go to God like that, not knowing where we stand? Or do we go knowing we are righteous because we're declared righteous? You're justified. Think about this next one, reconciliation. So it's one thing for God to say, not guilty. It's another thing to say, you're welcome at my house anytime. There's one thing to say, okay, you've hurt me, I forgive you. It's another thing to say, I forgive you, now come eat dinner at my house. Come hang out with me. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21 says that God reconciled us to himself in Christ and did not count our trespasses against us because he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. So is this more, is there anything that stands between you and God? Any partition or wall? If so, you imagine it's there. You've placed it there. You're pretending there's something between you and God when God says we are reconciled eternally. Christ paid the debt for your sin. He became your sin and died. God does not count your trespasses against you. You are reconciled. God's not like this busy guy who's in his office and sets the secretary outside and says, screen all my calls. And you know what? If so-and-so comes, tell them I'm not here. No. He gives you a key and says, you come by any time. Here's my other entry. This is, actually, here's a door with your name on it. You can come in and talk to me anytime. You can call me anytime. Personal number, day or night, I'll be there. Reconciled. There is nothing that you have ever done that makes me love you any less or is, holds anything back from me and you. We are completely, eternally reconciled, as if there was never anything between us. That's what that gospel means. Reconciliation. No sin that you've committed separates you from God in Christ. What about adoption? So it's one thing to say, okay, you're righteous, you're not guilty, and okay, you can talk to me anytime. It's another thing now to say, we're family. And that's what it does. 1 John 3, 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God. And such we are. When we accept Christ, we're justified, we're reconciled, but we're also adopted. He calls you his son, he calls you his daughter. And he wants you to call him father. That's the relationship he chooses to relate to us as. Not master-servant. Not employer-employee. Father-son. Father-daughter. 
That's what he wants. And your dad's always for you. Romans 8.31 says, if God's for us, who can be against us? Think about this for a moment. If God showed up here, visibly, right now, would we believe that he is here for us or against us? Paul says he's for us. He's for you. You guys see that? When we come to know and truly believe the love God has for us, there is no fear of punishment because perfect love casts out fear. He is for us, not against us. Ken and I were talking last week, and we were talking about the presence of God. And, and you know, in Psalms, it says that the presence of God is a refreshment. And I said, honestly, I've never viewed it that way. I always viewed that if God was in the room, I better behave better. I better do better. I better stop fooling around. I better stop messing up. I better be like, oh, God's here. You might tuck my shirt in, you know. Let me make sure everything's perfect. Okay, I'm going to do my work. I'm not going to talk like he was a teacher. Looking over the, stu the shoulder of his student. I wrote that in this paper by professor, and he says, I pray that you understand that God is always for you. For you. <clears throat> always secure, always loved. If we truly understand that and truly believe those implications of the gospel, we could confidently say that as Jesus is, so are we. And what happens if you look at verse 18, that there is no fear in love, perfect love casts out fear. You know... <laughs> God loves you with all the love he has. He held nothing back from the Son. He holds nothing back from you. Jesus has no more love than you do. You have no less love than he does. And if we could grasp this, it would change everything. Martin Luther said that the average Christian is religious enough to feel guilty when they do wrong. But they never get to the point where they can enjoy the new life they've been given. And so many of us live that life. I have lived that life for so long. And it's so easy to slip back into that life where you always feel guilty about your sin, but you never truly get to feel joy in Jesus and happiness and pleasure. God's presence never turns from a threat to a refreshment. It always stays scary. There's always that fear. But love should free us. Let me tell you something. Before I met Katie, single guy, okay, every other single woman on the planet that was remotely my age, when I would meet any of them, you know what happened immediately? A little bit of fear. I would start to think, how's my hair look? How's my breast smell? I gotta lose some weight, man. How's my clothes? I gotta, I gotta act a certain way. And I would turn into either a shy person that like was super self-conscious, or I'd be, have way too much confidence and I'd show off and become obnoxious, right? It was one or the other. And I never knew, I was so awkward on every girl. Then I met Katie, and for some reason she married me, and now you know what happened. Now that I know this girl loves me and has committed to me, now all of a sudden something changed. I am free from the need to perform for any other woman on the planet. Now I don't care what they think of me, because Katie loves me. Free. It's Finn. At all the other day with Katie, he was sitting in the grocery cart, you know, and this worker was right there, and he goes, hey, hey man. And the guy ignored him. He goes, hey, excuse me. How's your day going? Excuse me. And the guy never even looked at him. And Katie was watching. And he kind of drops his head. And, you know, he was just, he was down. And uh, they go and they pay and they get in the car. And he was down the whole time. And finally he goes, mom. And as they're driving home, he goes, why didn't that guy even look at me? And Katie goes, I was looking at you. And I'm really proud of you for being friendly. And you know what happened to Finn? A smile came on his face. That, that disappointment and discouragement from that random guy who probably didn't mean to be rude but was busy, left him, and he was freed. He was freed from whatever that guy thought about him and however that guy treated him because he was loved by his mom, and that was enough for him. That's an amazing thought. Now, here's the problem, though. We can't be defined by any human love because humans fail us. Some of you were at, where was, you were at in my shoes, and you can look at your wife or your husband and say, their love is all I need, and then they left. And the... What the fear that you had originally is now doubled over because a human failed you. Some of you guys have been failed by your parents, and some of you have failed your parents and, and broken up, and you don't speak anymore. I mean, humans fail us. But it does give us a glimpse of the freedom we could have in love. We read in Isaiah 42, he's like, could a mother forget her young? But even if they do, I won't forget you. God's better than a mom. He loves you more than your mom does. It's an amazing thing to think about. There's freedom in love. God's love casts out fear. 
This is what I want you to know. I know you know it. I fear that you don't believe it. That it hasn't gone from your head to be a truly something you rest in, in your heart. That you can truly say, as Jesus was loved, so am I. But if you can get there, think about the freedom that comes. You're free from being defined by the actions of others. Your parents, your spouses, your children, anybody. Their actions don't define who you are. Their actions don't define what you're worth. Their actions don't define how much value you have. God's love does. There's a freedom in that. You're free from the need to perform for the acceptance of others and their expectations. How freeing is that? To know that you are so loved by God that if you can't perform to their high expectations and they love you less, it doesn't really matter because they don't define you. Do you think Jesus got through his whole ministry saying, everybody hates me? I'm the hated one? No, he says, I'm the loved one, even though he was surrounded by hate. He was free from their expectations. He was free from the need to perform for their acceptance. Think about how many people walked away from Christ. Think about the rich young ruler. I love you. You can have eternal life. Here's what you got to do. Just, just leave all that stuff and follow me. And he walked away. It says Jesus loved him, but you see Jesus running after him and begging him. No, he felt compassion, but he kept on doing his thing because he wasn't going to change for that guy. He was God's man. He was God's son. You see that, how he was defined. He had this freedom. How about this? You're free from the fear that drives legalism. Legalism. A rule-based relationship with God is fueled by a fear and a need to be accepted by God based on your works. But when you understand how great God's love for you really is, understand the implications of the gospel, you are free from that. You are free to run to God after your worst, worst moment. I remember once I, uh, in high school, you know, I was a legalist. I really was. I loved Jesus, but I was a judgmental guy, and I cared about rules. And even if another guy loved Jesus, if he didn't follow my rules, I thought he was less. That was the truth. And I was winning at religion. And then I got to college, and I started losing because I just, I was tired of that relationship with God. I was tired of following all the rules. So I started being dumb, and I just wanted to enjoy life. And all of a sudden, you know what I went from? from legalism to worldliness. And I remember the day I was driving down Canoe Creek Road and I was following my buddy and we both had motorcycles at the time. He borrowed his roommate's motorcycle and I borrowed my dad's motorcycle and we both wrecked. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I broke my arm, you know, he was all skinned up and we didn't hit anybody. We literally just, we hit some gravel out on a country road and we both fell. And I remember in that moment, I wanted to pray and I didn't. All I wanted to do was talk to God and ask him for help, ask him to help me. And, you know, I was afraid. We didn't have motorcycle licenses. So I'm like, I don't want to go to jail. And I think my arm is broken. I don't want to call my dad. My whole life shattered. And I remember in that moment, I never prayed. And about a week later, it hit me. I wanted to pray, and I didn't. Legalism held me back. Legalism broke me so that when I finally did fall out of my winning religion and into a sinful life, then I felt like that sin now separated me from Christ. You see that? It was a fear. I didn't believe God's love for me. I felt like when I was doing good, he loved me. When I was doing bad, he doesn't. When I needed him most in that moment, I didn't feel like I could run to him. That was legalism. You can be free from that fear. You can be free from being defined by the choices of your past. When you truly understand that nothing holds you back from God, yes, you've sinned. But Christ paid for those sins. It doesn't mean they're not serious. But it means they don't separate you from God. They don't keep you from being loved, that you are forgiven for them, that he doesn't hold those against you, that the Bible says that they're separated. We're separated from our sins as far as the east is from the west. They're buried in the deepest depths of the ocean. It says that the Father is going to throw them into the sea of forgetfulness. They're gone. They don't hold you back. There's freedom. And how about free to forgive other people when they fail you? Free to let go of bitterness for past wounds and hurts because even though they failed you, you're okay because you found a greater love. Even though they have rejected you or betrayed you, you can learn to forgive and move on because they don't define you anymore. You could have you could, the freedom to have joy and peace in every, any circumstance. Finally, have the freedom to be the person that God knows you are and says you are and calls you to be. Do you believe that? Are you living free? 
Find freedom in the love of God. Believe your love like Jesus. If you don't believe that this morning, if you can't accept that, then just ask God to show you how loved you are. Ask him to open up his word to you. Read John 15, John 17, read 1 John chapter 4 and start to really look through this. Read Romans chapter 8 or the whole book of Romans and say, God, I'm going to read this book and the only thing I want to see in this entire book is your love for me. And trust that he'll show you. The problem isn't that God's love's not reaching you. The problem is that you're not letting it get there. That you're not opening your eyes to it, opening your heart to it. He always has loved you. And if you're sitting there this morning and and you haven't asked Jesus Christ to save you, look what you're missing out on. Look at the love we found. That same love is yours and can be yours if you'd only receive it in faith. God loves you so much. He loves all of you. And he loves me. You can pray that when you wake up each day, you can boldly declare that I am loved like Jesus. And come what may, at the end of today, I will still be loved like Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And thank you for loving us. It's a love so infinite that it's enough for each of us. You hold nothing back from us. And we hear it, and Lord, sometimes we dare not truly believe it. Help us to believe it. Help us to be overwhelmed by the love you have for us. May it change us. May it free us. May it unlock the key to enjoying you and your son. May we learn this now so that we can truly enjoy you forever. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.